Um, inside of you is an innate desire to be connected to other people. And that burden of family, of meaningful friendships, of relationships, is equal parts blessing and burden. In fact, you cannot separate burden from blessing. And that's what brought us into last week. We talked about the reality of being blessed with a burden. That you have, there's something inside of you that, that kind of pushes you and, and kind of grates up against you. And when you see these things happening in the world, sometimes you see injustice, you see brokenness, you see suffering, you see pain, and it gets you all fired up. And you feel like sometimes you're the only one in your family, in your workplace, in, in your community of friends that cares about this thing and that you need to do something about it. And that's because God has blessed you with a burden. Now, God's blessed all of us, and we say it every week. In fact, I said it just a moment ago. God's blessed all of us with equal portions of time, talent, treasure, and testimony. And the question is, are you being a good steward of the blessings that he's bestowed upon you? I think sometimes as Christ followers, and especially Christ followers in today's modern church culture, it's easy for us to not be good stewards of our blessing. It's easy for us to make big mistakes when it comes to our blessing. Now, some of you are sitting in the room right now, and you still don't even believe the reality that you are blessed. Do me a favor. Say, I am, I am. Blessed. blessed. Come on. You're blessed. Blessing isn't a paycheck. It isn't a reward. It isn't, oh, I got good grades, therefore God's going to give me a blessing. Because if that was true, if a blessing was simply based off of your behavior, then what happens when you misbehave? But grace is sufficient in the middle of our misbehavior. You already are blessed because you're part of his family. Now, that's hard for some of us because the families that we grew up in didn't feel like a blessing, did they? Some of our families put the fun and dysfunctional, don't they? But there's, there's doors that open when you are connected to a family name that is a family of blessing. In my circle of friends, I have lots and lots of pastor, ministry, uh, missionary friends all over um, the, the world for that matter, but most, most specifically in Southern California. And, you know, my dad and before me was a pastor as well. My kids, most of them are following in my footsteps and we're a ministry family. My wife is a pastor's kid. And so like we're well known in the Southern California region of the Assemblies of God network of pastors. If you say Roundtree, people know who we are. Now I'm not saying that to be like, oh, we're such a big deal, right? right? I'm just saying like, I've worked really hard. My father worked really hard. My father-in-law worked really hard to like lay a foundation that we all get to stand on. And now my kids and my grandkids will get to stand on that foundation as well. And sometimes my children walk into opportunities when it comes to their career of choice, which happens to be a ministry career, and doors have opened for them because they have the blessing of the round tree name. And sometimes, right, your last name's not so much a blessing, but is it? Yeah, sometimes it's like a bit of a curse, right? Oh, like I'll remember this. I'll never forget it, right? I was 16 years old, had my driver's license for maybe just a few weeks. I was super proud of myself that I had never missed curfew at that point in time. Um, and it was, a, it was a Wednesday night youth group. I was at church and my youth pastor said, hey, let's go out. I'll buy you a hamburger and a soda after youth group. We can hang out. And I'm like, sweet. I told my parents. And I remember this is a long time ago, so we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have pagers back then, okay? Like you had to go to a pay phone, right? And, you know, like, and, and just use them. And now the only reason you go to a pay phone is if you're like, hey, I feel like I should get hepatitis today. Um, right? Like you don't even see them anywhere anymore, right? And, and then that's how you know you're like in a really sketchy part of town is there's still a pay phone there. Like, if there's a payphone, keep on driving. Yeah. Right. And so um, I, I, looked at, I looked at my watch, and I was like, oh, no, I'm going to be late. And so I jumped in my little Volkswagen that was souped up. It was super awesome. It could go zero to 60 in about six minutes or so. Um, and I just floored it, and I was driving as fast as that little thing could. And, of course, on the night, it was youth group night. I went out with my youth pastor. Great night. Everything was wonderful. I, I decide I'm driving home, and I'm speeding. And then what happens? Woo! get pulled over the highway patrol pulls me over and you know like I'm just I'm not even that far from the house like I can see where we live 
and he pulls me over and he says, uh, and I'm, I know I'm in trouble, right? And like a dumb kid, I get out of the car, I walk and sit on the bumper. It was a different time. You don't do that now, right? You don't do that, okay? Regardless um, of who you are or the color of your skin, don't do that, okay? So I get out, I walk, I sit on the back bumper, I hang my head down. Officer comes up, he starts talking to me. He goes, do you have your driver's license? I reach in my pocket, I pull it out, I hand it to him. He looks at Eric Roundtree. He goes, oh, you're Pastor Al's boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am. And in that moment, he, that, that officer blessed me. He handed me my driver's license, and he said to me, go and sin no more. <laughs> it's pretty good, right? I was like, oh, a good dad joke. And I got in my car, and I drove very carefully home. Right? I walked in the door, one minute to spare. Boom, I made it. Right? And, and he blessed me, and he blessed me because of the family I belong to. I didn't earn it. I was dead to rights. I shouldn't have been speeding, but I did it anyway. I made a decision to make a choice to break the rules. I knew that that's where that highway patrolman parked his car and hid all the time. <clears throat> I had been warned and did it anyway, right? And so sometimes there's a blessing attached to who you are connected to. Sometimes there's a blessing attached to what that looks like, right? You belong to Jesus. Say, I belong, I belong. to Jesus. So your big brother, Jesus, offers <clears throat> blessing on your behalf. Anybody grow up in school with an older sibling? Yeah, and maybe that older sibling, either they got really good grades, and so all your teachers expected you to get really good grades, or your older sibling was a terror, and, and your teachers were just happy to have you not be your older sibling. They would, and they'll say, teachers will say things to you about that, won't they? They'll just be like, man, I had your brother, and he was hell. It's, such, it's so amazing to have you in my class. Your brother was awesome when he left. That's when he was awesome, you know? Or, you know, like, I would get this all the time. Like, your sister was so good in my class. Why can't you be more like your sister? Yeah? yeah and, and so, like, sometimes your name precedes you, goes ahead of you. As a child of God, we call ourselves by his name, Christ, Christians. And there's automatically a blessing attached to that. The, the problem is, is that most of us aren't stewarding that blessing to its full capability, right? There's three ways that we don't do that well. There's three ways that we make, I call them big blessing mistakes. Number one is some of us have developed a habit of ignoring God's blessing. What do I mean by that? Well, you like to take credit for the blessing that God's bestowed upon you. You, you say, I did this. I built this. I made this, Right? Like, when you look at, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, right? So those of, some of you have, like, really great children, right? My wife, Jennifer, and I, we have been very blessed that we have some amazing kids. Um, they have done, they're, like, turning out to be great. Um, three of them are adults. Uh, one is almost an adult. Um, Becca's 16. She's graduated. She's already in college. I'm so proud of her at 16 to be able to do all that. Like, we're super blessed. Yeah, give it up for Becca. I'm super proud of my kids. I get way more credit than I deserve, right, when my kids do good things. And when they do stupid things, I get way more blame than it's actually mine, right? First of all, my kids are the way my kids are, number one, because of their mother, not their father. Number two, because of Jesus, like, I'm just, he blessed us. I don't know if he knew that I couldn't handle wild kids. I don't know what the deal was, but like, it's been easy. They, I mean, like, they just, they, they do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it, and I've been blessed. And some of you are like, I wish I had that blessing. I bet you do. Right? But it would be weird for me to go, I did this. They're like that because of me. I am the world's greatest father. My mug says so, right? Sometimes you can convince yourself that the wealth that you've amassed, the family that you've built, the education that you have, the property that you own, the vacation that you got to go on, that that's all you, that you did it. But didn't God bless you with the ability to do those things? And so if you're not careful, you can ignore the blessings of God and convince yourself that it was all you when it was really God working in and through you. 
Second big blessing mistake that we make, and <clears throat> this one's interesting. Um, it, it, it expresses itself in, in a couple of ways, but most specifically, it expresses itself when you are financially stable um, or even wealthy. You, ha- you feel like you have to apologize for the blessing that God has given you, all right? It, it, it expresses itself like this. I find myself, if I'm not careful, someone will say, oh, isn't that nice that you got whatever, right? And then I'll have to say, well, I got it on sale. I'll have to justify why I deserved to spend that money on my family, right? Somebody recently was like, well, isn't it, it how do you guys, you guys have Disney passes? Oh, I'm in the wrong business. I should become a pastor. Well, we could trade places, right? Yeah, and so I have to justify why I have Disney passes, right? And, you know, like, you feel like these, this pressure, right? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I pay my tithe. I'm generous. I help people. If I want to bless my family with Disney passes, that's between me and Jesus. But how often do we feel pressure, right? God has blessed us so that we could be a blessing to others, and we feel pressure to somehow make ourselves feel like less than, that if we don't, if we don't present ourselves as poor. Now, I'm not going to swing the pendulum the other way and be like one of these pastors that you see on TV. Like, there's a balance and a humility that's important, but there's also, like, if you own a big house, have a life group at your house. Don't be ashamed of your big house just because some of the people that are in this room don't have a house. God's blessed you with the ability to have the job, to take care of the things that you have to take care of, to invest into that home. So use that home to be a blessing to others, not, I don't want to have a life group in my house because then everybody will start treating me different once they see my big house. Come on. Like, don't, don't apologize when God blesses you, all right? Come on. Sometimes we... We get blessed with something that somebody else has been wanting, right? Like you have friends that are trying to have a baby, right? Trying to have a baby, trying to have a baby, trying to have a baby, and, and you're pregnant. Oh, cool. Oh, I'm so sorry that I'm pregnant and you're not. It's weird, right? Like in this season of your life where you're at right now, it's a blessing that you're with child. So enjoy that blessing. Now I'm not talking about being a jerk, Right? Going to your friend's house who's had six miscarriages and be like, oh, man, being pregnant is so cool, right? Don't be a jerk, right? But, like, it's okay for you to walk in the blessing of what's happening in your life right now. If you got a promotion, I want to celebrate that with you, right? Church, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to remove a sentence out of your vocabulary. Will you honor pastor and do this for a moment? You ready? Stop saying the phrase, must be nice. Oh, you got a raise? Must be nice. Oh, you got a new car? Must be nice. So mean. You know what you're saying when you say that to people, right? I'm jealous. I'm jealous that you have something I don't have. Must be nice to be you. You're saying it was easy. You didn't earn it. You didn't work hard. No. Actually, it's not always nice to be me. I had to put a lot of late hours in to get to this position, to get that promotion that came with that raise. Must be nice to own my own house. Yeah, it's really nice, especially when it rains and the roof leaks, and I'm still trying to figure out how to make that leak stop. It must be nice to have that new car. It was really nice until I got the car. first car payment was due. Right? Like, don't apologize for your blessings. Lastly, stop hoarding God's blessing. Stop hoarding God's blessing. Let me give you an example of this. I think because we're Americans, we'll understand it. You ready? Americans have this issue where we consume a lot of food and then we don't move around enough. Right? And then a result of that consuming a lot but not moving enough is called obesity right and you can travel all around the world and you can see people who aren't obese right 
And the reason that Americans are so obese is because we're blessed. Come on. And we hoard that blessing. And we consume more than we should. And we don't move around, serve, exercise as much as we could. Now, before some of you are like, Pastor, you're always mean to fat people. I'm, I'm preaching to me, okay? I'm just saying, right? The reason I'm using that as an example is because I think it translates into our spiritual walk as well. When God blesses you, you're supposed to take that thing and not just consume it. You're supposed to save some of it, and you're supposed to share some of it, and then you only eat what you need. Some to save, some to spend, some to share. And if you're hoarding God's blessing, do you know what happens to hoarders? They become very lonely, trapped by their stuff. And do you know the difference between a hoarder and a collector? Hoarders are just poor. Like when you're rich, I collect fancy cars, right? But when you're poor, I have a bunch of cars in my backyard that don't run. See the difference? Yeah. It's the same core issue. Why do we hoard? Well, some of us grew up with not enough. And so because we grew up with not enough, we feel like we have to have something. These are all issues. I'm going to tell you something. I tell you this every week. These are all issues that your pastor wrestles with. And the reason I'm sharing this message with you is because I know if I'm wrestling with it, I guarantee you are too. Some of you are better at these than me. But for the most part, if you look at your lives, we either ignore, apologize, or hoard. And some for right reasons. Some of my first memories as a child was in preschool. I'll never forget it. I was actually, it was bathroom break time and all the boys went into the boys' bathroom and they had this like row of tiny midget urinals. Sorry, little people urinals. All right, and so I'm, I'm there doing my business at the urinal and the boy next to me grabbed my ankle, lifted up my shoe and told everybody else in the bathroom that my shoes weren't authentic vans, that they were knockoffs preschool I didn't even know what was happening I just knew I was embarrassed in that moment so I went home and I was mad at my dad right and I told him off and I was like dad you, you bought me these crappy shoes I'm in like preschool I shouldn't even know how to say that right and for the rest of my life I've had this thing inside of me my mom would be like hey let's go get you some new shoes I don't want no new shoes if we're going to pay less I'll just keep these ones. And I would save up my own money, and the first thing I would do is I'd buy myself a pair of name brand shoes. Because sometimes things happen to us in our past that affect our present. And so some of us, because we lived a season of our life with lack, wanting, desiring more, and we have hurts, habits, and hangups, we're keeping the blessings of God from flowing through us and we're stopping them up and we're becoming spiritually obese by hoarding our blessings because of something that happened to us a long time ago. So I wanna challenge you today. I wanna challenge you to be thinking about yourself as blessed. Everybody say it again, say I am blessed. I am blessed. But I'm blessed so that I can do something with it. I'm blessed so I can change people's lives. I'm blessed so I can bring hope to the world. I'm blessed so I can bring second chances and new beginnings. I'm blessed so I can love my family. I'm blessed so that I can develop my community. I'm blessed for a reason. Grab your Bibles, go with me. How many of you guys have your Bibles? Hold them up high if you got your Bible with you. 2020, the year that we are taking ownership of our own discipleship. And so I want to challenge you to be bringing your Bibles, bringing your notebooks. I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 20. Just going to read you a couple of verses, verse 32 through 35. Paul's writing a letter to the church in Ephesus, and this is his farewell address to the elders of the Ephesian church. And I'm, I'm kind of excited, actually. I'm, this Wednesday, I'm heading to Turkey to, uh, on a trip to see some of the stuff that's happening over there with the Syrian refugee crisis. Over 900,000 mostly women and children have left Syria fleeing for their lives because of the civil war since 2014. And then it really escalated in 2017. Things have been out of control for the last few years together. And they're winding up in Turkey and they're winding up in Jordan. I'm going to Syria, or I'm going to Turkey um, to work with some of the Syrian refugee population there that are in their urban communities. 
And I want to go and kind of bridge the gap from those of us who live here in El Cajon and those of us who are going to be serving overseas. There's like a connectivity to, for us there, isn't there? All right. So I'm going to go over and find out about it. While I'm there, Turkey is the, the home of the church at Ephesus. And so, of course, if you take a bunch of pastors to go see what's happening in Turkey, we're all like, you need to take us to Ephesus. We want to stand where Paul stood. We want to see what Paul saw. And so we're going to go to Ephesus. And so I was like kind of fascinated this week as I was preparing because I leave on Wednesday. Um, appreciate your prayers. <clears throat> Hopefully I get my voice back before then. Right? And listen to what Paul says. He's giving them, this is his final statement to the, the elders at the Ephesian church. And he says, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which he can build you up and give you an inheritance. And so he's giving this farewell, sort of like goodbye statement. Uh, It's on you now. I've done everything I can for you. I've taught you everything I could teach you. Stay true to God's word. Stay true to him. His word is an investment in your future. Um, He says it's an inheritance among all those who are sanctified or set apart for his purpose, right? And then he says something interesting in verse 33. And it was interesting to me that he took the time to include this in his final goodbye statement to them, right? Listen to what he says. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, everybody say hard work, work. we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And Paul, in that short statement, he reminds them that there's something important about working hard so that you can, right, show yourself worthy to be blessed. I want you to think about it, right? When you, when you invest in somebody, whether it's your children, friends, neighbors, coworkers, when you buy cookies from a Girl Scout, right? You're investing in that little girl, right? right? When you do that, do you invest in someone who isn't responsible? Or are you trying to invest in someone who's doing a good job? So if two Girl Scouts stood in front of you and one was like, want to buy cookies? Right? You're like, no. Right? And the other one was like, good morning, sir or ma'am. Right? I'd love if you would support my troop by buying some cookies today, right? All of a sudden, you're like, oh, she's so cute. I'm going to buy her cookies, right? And, and so you're investing in the one, right, who's presenting themselves well, who's working hard, right? Again, I'm not trying to undo what I said earlier. Blessings of God, you already are blessed. And, and the container in which you hold your blessing in, most of us is already full and somewhat overflowing, What I'm challenging today is expand the container by which you hold your blessing. That's what hard work does. Hard work shows God that you can contain more. And so Paul is saying to them in his farewell, he's like, guys, you got to work hard. If you don't work hard, I can't give you more. What he's saying is simply this. You were blessed so that you could be a blessing. Don't waste it. Don't ignore it. Don't hoard it. Don't apologize for it. Receive God's blessing and reflect that blessing on the people he's entrusted to you. Now, this has a little bit to do with money, but really, it's about time. It's about your talent. It's about your testimony. Sure, treasure is a part of that, but it's so much more than that. When Jesus says, and this is Paul quoting Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive, that statement in and of itself is somewhat counterintuitive, isn't it? I mean, you understand it if there are people in your life that you care about deeply, and at Christmas time you buy them gifts and you wrap them up and you give them to them. Like when you have kids and grandkids, right? I mean, right now I have my one grandson. Abraham, and every, I get him on Monday nights, we babysit him, and then on Tuesday nights, because it's youth group. So Monday nights, his mom and dad have life group, and on Tuesday nights, they serve in student ministries and help out, and so I get him Mondays and Tuesdays. I used to get him on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I like that better, but they switched their life group, and so now I have to wait from Tuesday all the way to Sunday to see him, and you figure it out, 
yeah, figure it out. Um, my favorite thing to do with Abraham is like I, I'm, now that I'm pops, right? When I was dad, I was kind of like, I'm not taking you to buy toys, right? Abraham, I'm like, you want to go buy something? What do you want, right? And we go to the store. Kid's little, and he knows how to try on clothes, right? He'll like point out stuff and put his hands up, right? Put that shirt on me, pops, right? Right? The other day, we went to the store. He wasn't even with us, and we wound up in the kid's section, and I was like, let's buy this, let's buy that, let's buy this, let's buy that, right? When you have people in your life, like a grandchild, you understand this verse better than maybe you did before. Like it's more blessed to give than to receive. But like up until that point in my life, I don't know that I totally got it. I mean, I think I got it. I tried to get it. But if I asked you right now, I need somebody that will give me a $100 bill, there'd be a short line of people that would stand up to do that. I I bet there's people in this room that would. But if I said, right, I want to give away a $100 bill, there'd be a bunch of people lining up, wouldn't they? Because even though we know this is a true statement, the way we live it out, it's more blessed to receive than to give, right? And so we're hoarding those blessings when God gave them to you freely, right? And so that, the biggest challenge for us today is to really take this action and make it a reality. Say it with me again. I'm blessed to be a blessing. So I'm going to give you four quick things this morning. If you're taking notes, you want to write these down. If you forgot your notepad, um, you can take pictures of the screen today, or you could go to our merch store. we got three different Hope City notepads that you can get um, that are awesome, so you could be taking notes and be doing that as well. Um, that being said, number one, we're blessed to give joyfully. Everybody say joyful. This is not a normal, like, cheer, joy, happiness Um, It doesn't seem to be a normal expression in the modern-day Christian church. Your church is a little bit weird. When you go to church, you cheer all the time. You ever notice that? Like, this is the most clappiest, happiest, cheering church. Like, every song. (laughs) Woo! How you doing, church? Yeah! Whoa! Yeah! Right? All the time. You've been in churches before that didn't do that, didn't you? Right? It was weird the first time you saw it. You're like, why? Well, because we're trying to do what God says to do. Be joyful. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Not just be happy, be happy twice. Right? But there's something about us that it gets in the way. We'll cheer for hours until our voice goes hoarse for our favorite sports team. Right? But there's a level of awkwardness, right? Do you ever stand up where you are right now? Everybody stand to your feet and just cheer for Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Good job. Much, much better than the 9 o'clock service. Seriously, 9 o'clock, they were like, yeah, this is awkward. Can we sit down now? Good job. Good job. The reason I think that's so important is Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, and he says, listen, let me give you some specific truth that will help you understand everything that there is to do in life. This is a timeless truth that applies to every avenue and aspect of your life. Work, home, school, finance, the way you raise your kids, what you're going to do, everything. You ready? This is timeless. He says, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. So if you plant just a few seeds, you're only going to get a few crops. He goes, but if you sow generously, you'll reap generously. And this truth is so timeless. Whatever you plant and the quantity in which you plant it is going to be reflected by the harvest. And so if you plant seeds of cheer, joy, generosity, happiness, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, right, then the fruit of the Spirit will grow and develop in your life. But if you plant seeds in mass quantity of hatred, shame, racism, frustration, complaining, 
sorrow, woe is me, what will grow? Those things, right? Well, I don't plant those seeds, really. So you're not going to get in the car today after service and complain in front of your children in the back seat? You're not going to wait for the waitress to walk away from the table and talk smack about her while they're watching? Come on. You're not going to talk back to the television when the newscaster says something about a presidential candidate that you don't like? So you're going to stop posting all that garbage that you've been posting on Facebook in Jesus' name? What kind of seeds are you planting? Come on. That stuff's going to come back. It's going to grow. And when you see your kid, I'm going to tell you something right now. There was a commercial in the 80s. Remember this commercial where the dad catches the kid and he's got drugs? And the kid looks at the dad. The dad's like, where'd you learn how to do this? And the kid's like, you are right. I learned it by watching you. And it was like, Parents who use drugs have children who use drugs, right? The 80s were great for drug commercials, weren't they? I mean, it made me not do drugs. What you sow, you will reap. The seeds you plant, that's what's going to grow. And so if you want your children and your coworkers and your neighbors and your community to be full of love and joy and second chances and compassion and kindness? What do you have to plant? Those things. So what are you planting? And so when when Paul writes this, listen to what he says, right? And this is in the context. He's talking about an offering that's going to be collected. And he says to them, listen, each of you should give as you've already decided in your heart and don't do it reluctantly. Don't do it under compulsion. Don't do it because someone's twisting your arm or because somebody's watching you and they're comparing your offering to someone else's. Don't do it for those reasons. He says, God loves a what? Cheerful, joyful, happy, stoked to be a part of what's happening, right? Now again, Paul's talking in the context of an offering right here, but the truth is timeless. So when you have to share your time with someone, be happy about it. Because some of y'all are time vampires. Like just talking to you just sucks the life out of me. I'm not going to lie about it, right? And we have the same conversation over and over and over again. And I have advice for you. Stop it. That's my advice. You come to me and you're like, Pastor, you know, I started drinking again. Stop it. Pastor, my wife and I got in a fight again. Stop it, right? If it was that easy, right? But yeah, but how, right? I don't know the answer to that, right? But I choose joy even when you suck the life out of me. I'm just being real. Do you have a coworker that every time they talk to you, you're just like, gosh, if there was a way for me to get away from this person right now, I would do it, Right? And you're super godly and super good. So like when people talk to you and they're time vampires, you say, let me pray for you. Which means, let's end this conversation. Right? And, and you know, like, I get it, right? But what if you were more joyful about who you shared your time with? Like sometimes we're so busy with our schedule, we can't stop and help that person whose cars broke down. We don't have time to listen to that person who's going through something painful. And even if this is the 15th time they told you about it, maybe this time it'll stick. Maybe this time they'll listen when you say, stop it. I mean, we don't use those words, right? But like, there's only one message in the entirety of scripture. You know that, right? I mean, I preach like 50 times, 48 probably times a year, I preach a message for you guys. And there's really one connective message every single week. Jesus loves you. Stop being so stupid. Right? Week after week after week. And one of these weeks, we'll get it. Right? It clicks for us. And in that little area, in that little corner of our life, we do it. But do you know why it happens? Because somebody takes the time. And parent, somebody around you. Somebody takes the time to put a smile on their face 
and listen to you. Somebody joyfully shared their time, their talent, and their treasure, and it made room in your life just a little bit for you to step into life change, didn't it? God loves someone who shares what they have with a heart full of joy. I choose joy. Number two, you were blessed, so you got to make it personal. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, um, David needs to make a sacrifice, and the sacrifice that needs to be made, there's a local farmer who's offered to give him all the animals that are needed for the sacrifice. David's sacrifice, it's his issue that he has to deal with, and it's him and his soldiers that need to make this sacrifice, they need to pay back for the mistake that was done, right? And so David says to the farmer, thank you so much, but I'm gonna have to pay you for these animals. No, 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 my king, they're yours, you're my king, whatever I have is yours. No, 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 I can't make an offering that costs me nothing. There's, there's a, an element to us being generous with what we have with the people that are around us that's about taking it personal. I'm going to do something about this because I can. One of my least favorite things in all of my years of being a leader, being a manager, being in charge of organizations um, is when someone says this phrase, and if you're a manager or you're a boss, um, you'll understand what I'm saying right now, right? But that's not my job. Mamas, you know what I'm talking about, right? CEOs of the household, right? You know what I'm talking about. When one of the kids goes, but that's not my job. It is now. That's the quickest way for you to get more work on your plate or get fired. And I can't fire my kids, so you just get more work on your plate, right? But that's their job, right? No, when, when God asks you to care for someone that he's put next to you, that's your job. Take it personal. Do something about it. There's a reason that that person is in your proximity suffering because you're supposed to share what you have with them. You could ignore it and move to a different proximity, right? You could hoard what you have and not be a blessing. You can claim, right, that it's all you, not God. So why should I have to share it? This is mine. Or you could embrace the idea of being blessed to be a blessing, and you can take it personal. What's happening to you is happening to me. Together, we're in this. And help. Number three, if you want to steward your blessing well, um, then let me challenge you to take steps towards extravagant living. Abundant living. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus... I'll paint the picture as if he was here. Let's pretend that Mark chapter 14 was today in this building. And Jesus, he would, he would have been standing by the back doors next to that black box on the wall that says tithes and offerings. And as people walked out, the custom in most Jewish synagogues, as people would walk out, they would make an offering in a, in a collection box that would have been near the exit. And so as they were walking out, Jesus just posted up there and he was watching and some people gave a lot, and some people gave a little. And so then Jesus collected his disciples, and he goes, hey, see that person over there? They put in 25 bucks. See that person over there? They put in 50 bucks. That dude over there, he put in $1,000. And that, that little old lady right there, she put in two pennies. Who do you suppose, who do you suppose gave the most? And the disciples were like, well, the dude that gave a thousand bucks, duh. And Jesus goes, nah. The lady that gave the two pennies. Do you know why? Because that's all she had to live on this week. And she gave it like selflessly so that somebody else could be blessed. There's something powerful about that extravagant type, right? Here's what I mean by that. 
we use that word tithing all the time to talk about our, our money, our offering. 10% of our income comes back to God. It's his. He owns everything. He gives us 90. We give him back 10 so that other people can have an opportunity to grow, develop, become the men and women of God he's called them to be. And then we give over and above that. But, but you, can, you can tithe off of your time. You can tithe with your talent as well. Not instead of, but as well. All right? And the reason I'm talking about it is I think this is important, right? I think it's important for you to be extravagant with the people God's entrusted to you. Are you being extravagant with your time when it comes to your family members? Are you lavishing upon them the time that they deserve? Or instead, is your time being lavished somewhere else? With your face in your phone or on Netflix or in a book? Something wrong with your phone, a book, or Netflix, but your kids are only going to be kids for, the long, for that long, right? I mean, somewhere between 18 and 27 years, they're going to be in your house, depending on who you are and how you raise them, right? You're only going to get X amount of time with them. Are you lavishing upon them the blessing of your time, your attention? Over the years, my children have climbed up on my lap and have grabbed my face and held it so that I would listen to them. And while in the moment it was adorable, as I look back on those moments, it kind of breaks my heart. But they had to physically hold my head still so that I could hear what they had to say that was so important to them in that moment. Now, was it important in the grand scheme of the universe? No, no. But it was important to them. And your father in heaven, he listens intently with his eyes shining on you when you speak to him about stuff that isn't important. Are you lavishing upon them? I don't say that to give you shame. I say that so that we can make a difference, so we can change. If you're a manager, a boss, if you have a a work group that you're in charge of, are you lavishing upon them blessings? It isn't that hard to bring donuts to work. It isn't that hard to give people a couple hours off. Don't make them grind it out over the holidays if you don't have to. Bless them. Learn their birthdays. Find out their kids' names. Pay attention to them. Well, they're just employees. They're here to do a job and get a paycheck. Yes, but they're people, and you're a child of God, so treat them as such. Lavish upon them extravagant blessing. What does that look like? Well, it just means going, extravagance is just going above the norm, right? It doesn't mean go buy all of your employees' new cars. I mean, maybe you can afford to do that. You get a car, you get a car, I'm Oprah, right? No. Maybe it is just extravagance is just going, hey guys, it's Friday, it's three o'clock, everybody did what they were supposed to do, why doesn't everybody just go home? That's a good, that's awesome, how many wish your boss would do that to you? Yeah, right? Hey, man, it's Tuesday, so I got everybody tacos. The taco truck is coming. You can't do that every Tuesday, but the first Tuesday of every month, I can do it, right? Extravagance. If your kid, like, who are the people God's entrusted to you? When I talk about generosity, I'm not talking about offering. I'm talking about what you're offering to the people God's entrusted to you. Now, we do it corporately by putting money in a basket or giving online so that God can fuel and fund the ministry of our church, but that's just a tiny little part of what we do, isn't it? What we do here prepares us for what really happens out there. So what are we doing? What are we doing to change the world? That extravagance is very important. Stepping a step above just what's normal. Lastly, if you're blessed to be a blessing, then I want to challenge you to start giving sacrificially. Passage goes on, and the widow, she gave more than she even had to live on. She gave everything that she had, that huge sacrifice that she made. Yeah, extravagant, but then also, right, sacrificially. There's something about sacrifice that's powerful. Here's what I mean by that. We live in a culture where tipping is normal. In fact, if you don't tip, 
you kind of look like you're, you're a monster, huh? Right? Like, and some of us, we don't have jobs where we get tips, right? And so we can get like a little bitter about it, right? Nobody tips me, right? right? But I, let me go a step further than that. Like, the, when, you, when you tip somebody, right, you're giving them a little bit more. So that's extravagance. That's cool. Challenge you to give a little bit more when you go out today, especially if you're rocking your Hope City gear, right? If you're wearing your Hope City church, you need to tip 15% or better, okay? That's like a commandment from Pastor Eric, okay? Change your shirt if you're going to be stingy. I'm telling you right now. All right. But there's something about sacrifice that's powerful. There's something about giving out of what you don't have versus what you already have. I say it like this a lot of the times. Um, my wife, Jennifer, those of you who know her, she's amazing, but she's also, um, she's also my administrative assistant. Um, she's really good at organizing my life, and so it just made sense for her to do that too. Um, and she volunteers to do that for the church. And so often I'll say to her this phrase, hey, I need you to carve out some time for. And then I name a person or a project or something that has to happen. And when I say that phrase, I need you to carve out some time for, what I'm saying to her is, this is super important, this person, this project, this thing, I need to make it a priority. So if you have to trim something else so that I can do that, it's super important. Versus, yeah, yeah, go ahead and book them on Friday, because I don't really do a lot on Fridays. See the difference? Hey, can you carve out some time for me and this person to meet? Some of you are like clicking in your brain because you actually heard me say it out loud to her when you were standing with me, right? Hey, I need you to carve out some time for me and them to meet because it's important, right? I think it's a great example of what it means to be a sacrificial giver. My question to you is, are you carving out time for the people God's entrusted to you? Are you carving out your, like your finances to bless those people? Are you taking what you have when it comes to your talent and are you sharing it with them in such a way that it's sacrificial? I could be doing this instead, but I choose you. See, all of us were given these humans we call them family, we call them friends, we call them co-workers, we call them neighbors, we call them our community, we call them whatever name you want to call them. But God blessed you with the knowledge of his son and a relationship with him and a church like this and the ability to work and amass wealth and build and create and do and fix and make. Why? So that you could go look at my life. Aren't I blessed? No. He did it so that you could be a blessing to the people that you're in proximity to. And so as we close, I ask you to stand. I want to pray this verse over us as we get ready to worship one more time and wrap up our day together. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 and 14 says it like this. Paul, again, writing to the church of Corinth, he says, because of your service, which you have proved yourself men will praise God for your generosity and sharing with them and with everyone else I often think about what heaven will be like when I was a kid in Sunday school we used to sing this corny little song if you've been in church a long time you might remember it it went like this heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace I want to see my Savior's face heaven is a wonderful place yeah right and so we often think about heaven like that, right? Like it's just awesome and opulence and God's presence is there and there's no pain, there's no sorrow, there's no hurt, right? And the streets are made of gold. I've even preached messages like this, right? That God is so willing to be extravagant in his blessing upon us that he's prepared a place for us where the streets, the things that don't really matter, are made of the thing that we work our whole lives for cool right but I don't think that that's going to be the splendor of heaven 
I haven't been able to find a chapter and verse yet, but in my sanctified imagination, this is what I think the splendor of heaven will be like. People are going to come up to you and they're going to say to you, hey, we've never met before and you don't know me, but I'm here because of the time that you served. I'm here because of the offering that you made. I'm here because you created something and sent it to me. I'm here because you built a house for my family in Mexico. I'm here because you sent your pastor to find out about what's happening with the Syrian refugees in Turkey. I'm here because you served a meal to my dad and he got off the street. And when he got off the street, he was able to get us back. And then we got in church and our family got back together and life was made whole and complete. I'm here because of you. That's what Paul's saying in this verse. Because of your service, which you've proved yourself, it's that hard work that shows God that you're able to hold more blessing. It's that I've invested what he's already given me and I'm ready for some more. And that lives are being changed and you're bringing hope and compassion and life change to the world one person at a time. Thank God, he says, for your generosity. Thank God that he made a way for you and I. That he blessed us so that we can be a blessing. Do me a favor, sing this song with us one more time.